the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
saying I'm Donna Wares, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the May edition of our Community Book Club. Every month, we invite all of Los Angeles to read the same book with us, and then we get to together and talk about it. Tonight's very special guest is Charles Yu, an Irvine corporate attorney turned TV writer turned novelist. He started writing books in his spare time. In 2010, he published How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. Then two years later, he wrote Sorry, Please, Thank You, a short story collection, and then came Third Class Superhero in 2016. This month, we've all been reading his fourth book, Interior Chinatown, a bestseller that won the National Book Award for Fiction in November. Charles's latest book digs into Hollywood, pop culture, and the stereotyping of Asian Americans on TV. The National Book Award Foundation called Interior Chinatown a bright, bold, gut punch of a novel. Tonight, Charles Yu will be joining us for a conversation with my colleague, Times film critic, Justin Chang. Please join me in welcoming Charles and Justin to the LA Times Book Club's virtual stage. Hi there, welcome. Hi, thank you, Donna. Hi, Hi Justin. How, how are you Hi, doing? Hi, Charles. Hey, Donna. It's so great to finally meet you, Charles. We've been uh, talking back and forth by email for a while, and um, I'm so glad you're here with us. Yeah, and Justin, I'm excited. And Justin, of course, um, we haven't done an event together for a while, so this is uh, nice to have, have you back. Um, I wanted to mention we've had uh, quite a few questions already uh, from readers, and um, we'll be uh, collecting more during the book talk. Um, but I really didn't want to delay any further. Uh, we've had so much interest, and I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation tonight. So I'm going to just turn things right over to Justin, and um, then I'll just rejoin you both a little later. OK. Thanks, Donna. Appreciate it. Um, Charles, hello, and thank you so much for being here with us. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I'm so thrilled to speak to with you about uh, your wonderful book, um, which I know came out more than a year ago, but for many reasons, uh, some obvious, some not, I'm really glad we're having this conversation now. Um, before we do that, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to ask, I want to ask about something that's different, but related, because, you know, um, back in April, you know, near the beginning of the pandemic of 2020, April, I should say, uh, you know, you wrote a piece in The Atlantic um, that has really come to mind lately. Um, you know, it was about it was about amid all our kind of hand wringing about how surreal and unreal this moment was, that this was in fact our reality and we better get used to it and tear away our sort of comforting narratives of security and stability. And I just really want to quickly read this. You wrote, the COVID-19 outbreak is a reminder, the world isn't for us, we are part of it, we're not the protagonists of this movie, there is no movie. Um, and after all the suffering and wreckage have subsided, one good thing for our long-term viability will be to have changed our ways of thinking, to have regained a humility. Um, I think that's so well put, and as things do start to look like they are subsiding and improving, um, in some parts of the world, needless to say, it's still quite bad in other parts, um, what's your sense of just the state of things? And do you feel we may be at risk of losing that hard won humility all over again? I ask myself that a lot, so. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, I, and I'm so glad you brought it up. It's it's weird to hear your own words, you know, a, a little over a year <laughs> later um, and, and realize sort of how, much you just need to remind yourself of that piece is as much a reminder to myself as it is anything else you know of like uh you don't know anything you think everything you think you know just always question it and when i wrote that in like you said april 2020 i was talking about it subsiding sometime that year right uh and here and so and here we are of course with you know India and, and other places, Taiwan's having, you know, its own kind of outbreak. And, um, and I, I do, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I worry that it's the first thing that goes is, uh, uh it's so easy for the, for the mind to want to just shed the sort of pain of the last 15, 16 months. And, reframe everything, you know, as soon as possible. And, and it, so mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. And, and I, I think, yeah, the line you read about it, it not being a movie, again, that's, 
it's sort of a reminder to myself. I don't know that other people walk around as much as I do thinking of like, oh, this is <laughs> like that movie. Um, so it's just, you know, that kind of mindset is is something that I think maybe being from LA, being in America, being a privileged person, I have the luxury of thinking that way of thinking, oh, this is a narrative, you know, and life is just so much more chaotic than that. I think I identify very much with that myself and also being you know, living in LA and then just that temptation to compare everything to a movie, um, especially a disaster movie, uh, which is, um, and uh, I think that even though, yeah, perhaps we, of course, we all would have wanted this to end sooner, um, but your insights are so on point. And I think humility is a quality I'm always in search of uh, in myself and, and just in just in writing. And um, it's, uh, I, I think it's just an important thing to, to take with us. I mean, and this is a pretty good segue, I think, when you, this line about we're not the, the protagonists of this movie, there is no movie. Um, it's a good segue to Interior Chinatown, which is, of course, built on this idea that life is, or what if life were this TV show? And, and the protagonist of this story is someone, uh, an, an Asian man, an Asian American man, who is not your typical screen protagonist. Um, you know, reading this book, I, I was floored by just how um, inventively and elegantly you distill so many ideas that I personally spend a lot of my time thinking and sometimes writing about as a, as a movie critic and, and also as, as an Asian American, um, just about our perceived visibility, about the stereotypical roles that we are squeezed into and, and sometimes squeeze ourselves into. It, it's such an intricate and expansive work. Um, it feels fully formed, and yet I know it probably could not have emerged fully formed in your head. Um, it, it feels like a world that you had to gradually build and discover. And can you just tell us how that world, how it started? I mean, what was the first uh, seed of, of the idea for, for, for your, this Chinatown of yours? Sure. Um, the first seed was, uh, you know, vor version 473, basically. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it came about four years into the writing of, so there were many other seeds that got discarded. And um, about, I guess, about four years ago now, um, early 2017, you know, deep into the writing of the book, I had a, accumulated, oh, I don't know, like 80, 90 pages of stuff that I felt like somewhere I wanted to put it. I just didn't know what. And I had tried to build a framework around it. Uh, the The initial impulse was this this kind of magical realism. So for a while, the working title of the book was Fairy Tales for Immigrants. Uh, and I, I didn't know what that meant, but I just kind of liked the way it sounded. And it was a pretty nebulous idea. And uh, But I guess the idea was sort of like these immigrants come to America and assimilation would be this kind of magical thing that happens, that somehow they, they find a new home in this country. Um, and I, it just never worked, you know, I, I, on a sentence level, on, on a structural level. I just didn't know what I was doing with it. And so uh, I kept kind of restarting. And uh, somewhere in there, in those years I was banging my head against the wall, I had started working in TV. And I think it took a while, but the the idea must have sort of been percolating somewhere in my subconscious. And so when this, the, the seed that happened, or the seed that sort of presented itself was, uh, Willis's voice, really. The first lines of the book, what ended up being the first lines of the book, sort of popped in my head, which never happens to me. I don't usually have those eureka moments, but I thought, <laughs> oh, okay, I can hear it. Now I hear it. And so I, you know, I was off to the races, sort of. Right. And then from there, was it from Willis's voice to then, I guess, the idea of writing the book as, as a screenplay or, or a teleplay, uh, was that the next, or did that come later? Uh, yeah, it, it came pretty sh pretty shortly after. Uh, it, it was a, this initial euphoria, you know, this rush of, oh, I cracked something open. And so in, you know, in just a few weeks, I think uh, I had a, just a bunch of new stuff that I was really excited and about, and it was, um, 
you know, what ends up ended up being a, a lot of the first 40, 50 pages of the book, the roles that Willis has played, the roles that his parents have played. And somewhere in there, as I kind of started to build out the idea of Willis and these other characters as performers, you know, performing their identity at the same time, they're kind of living their identity, you know, living their roles. Um, somewhere in there came the idea of, well, if he's an actor, what kind of show is he on? Yeah. And I, I needed sort of a really rock solid foundation. And I thought, what is the most rock solid thing that, well, what do people really understand? What's our, what's our form, our contemporary form? It's mm -hmm. a police procedural, you know, it's, it's like, if you've lived in America in the last 30 years and own a television, Law and Order has been on your television probably, either intentionally or not. And so, um, among other shows, but I mean, that one to me is the iconic one. I, I've watched a lot of it. And um, so, yeah, so so then it's like Willis is in this show. What? How do, how do I capture the sense of Willis being front stage and backstage, you know, performing, but also being able to kind of address the audience and slip aside. So the, sc the screenplay format was really instrumental because it was actually the constraint that freed me, you know, it, by being so rigid, I could then try to s use Willis's voice and slip in and out of that framework, if that makes sense. It, it does. I mean, that's, that's so well put. I mean, and it, it, to write this book as as a screenplay, it, it is such an ingenious formal conceit because it, it of course, is a very uh, gives you an easy and direct way to uh, satirize the conventions of of the, this procedural style show and and of Hollywood uh, genres in general. Um, but as you say, it gets at this larger idea of of a a a simulation, uh, not to be confused with assimilation, sorry. That just suddenly <laughs> weirdly occurred to me. Uh, it's, cool. it's, it's like a, a pun <laughs> with that. No, on I, that. I, <laughs> I just I, that, when you said um, assimilation earlier, it just it just popped into my head. But and and the, 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 the simulation is 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 absurd and and is is racist um, to its core. Uh, you know, it, it's and and as you say, you know, the ability to you know it gives you direct access to your protagonist's uh, inner life, but it also the rigidity of the screenplay structure allows you. to create this sense of entrapment that he doesn't have agency. Um, and you know, you you have um, you know, you have written for TV and and especially Westworld, which you know has of course some some thematic connections with this world as well. Um, you obviously had that form down pat. I mean, was it uh, I, I imagine that was very helpful in terms of uh, you know making the leap saying, okay, yes, this is going to be um, a, a screenplay uh, structured uh, type of novel, right? I mean, having that foundation was was helpful. It, it was helpful. I, I'm not sure I have it down pat. <laughs> and I'm not sure any any of the showrunners I worked for would think I have had it down pat. Uh, I very much was a novelist, newbie, you know, steep learning curve, especially in Westworld. And my bosses have, without exception, been really understand, I think, you know, understanding even when I uh, probably was <laughs> breaking every rule that I didn't even know were rules, uh, uh, writing, you know, writing tone poems, you know, and or pitching <laughs> abstract concepts in the room. But it did give me, to your point, Justin, it did give me a little more confidence. You know, I, I doubt I would have felt safe enough trying something with a form that I, and, and, and really it was like a, right. It was just a fun box of toys to play with is what it was. Yeah. One of the, it, it's fun to, it, I mean, needless to say, on the most basic level, it's very fun to read. And, and it feels like, uh, for people who've read a lot of screenplays, I imagine perhaps even more so, um, but it, it's a book that teaches you how to read it as, as you go along. And, and there are times when you very much experiment with the structure, when you open up the form of, of the script, and whether that's with the, you know, just the occasional, the quotes, um, the epigrams that, that are throughout the book. Um, and also, you know, toward the end, you, uh, it feels like you're exploding the structure as toward the finale, you know, you, you lay out a lot of, a lot of background, um, a lot of facts about the history of anti-Asian American discrimination in the U.S., uh, including but not limited to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and the book becomes 
you know, a lesson as well as an exploration. Uh, that's, but maybe that's a little reductive to call it a lesson. It not, you know, but it's it, that's very much a part of it. And I, yeah, just how can you talk about just the pro deciding? Okay, when is this going to be like a screenplay? When is this not going to be a little bit less like like a screenplay? And and also just yeah, bringing in all of that history and and the research that you did. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> so after I kind of had the conceit and felt like, okay, this is enough to um, write a book or try to assemble a book out of the pieces I had, that then what I had was a chunk that was about Willis and these characters. And then I had the original 80 or 90 pages. And I I thought, well, this is almost a book. It's approaching a book, but it's it's not um i needed some sort of connective tissue i needed a i needed a, a larger framework and i needed a story you know and i thought so i spent a couple of years really banging my head against the wall figuring out yeah. you know what's the story here you know what's and, and do these pieces even go together or am i trying to force them together um and and my editor and my agent that they were really instrumental in helping me shape that um but it ultimately you know, it came down to a couple of things. And w one was, um, as you mentioned, this kind of, uh, there's a, the book builds to this kind of, you know, courtroom set piece. And, and without spoiling anything, you know, that's a, it, it, to get there, it's like, how do I get from A to B to Z? Um, and some of it had to do with, you know, making disjunctive leaps, feeling like, yeah. Oh, I'm over connecting these pieces. You know, um, I have to, I have to reference um, something, some of your work. And actually, uh, you you interview, you wrote a book, right, called Filmcraft oh. about editing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, someone's read it. I'm, I'm I, talking, don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fascinated. Uh, and you interviewed Walter Murch, whose book I read years ago, Good. just sort of randomly, yeah. you know, and he... He's the greatest, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was, it was really fascinating. I mean, I, I wish we could just derail this and talk about, I want to ask you questions. <laughs> uh, but, but he has, and uh, I'm going to butcher this, so I should probably let you do it, but one of the main criteria, if not the number one criteria for how he edits was emotion, right? That's yes. sort of in his rule of six. Um, it's, it's like emotion and rhythm and what, and story, I think not in that order maybe, but, but he's basically, that's how we think those are like sort of the top three. I think for me, it's, 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 it's maybe I flip the order, but that's probably the order for me. It's like rhythm and emotion are almost like tied together. So I can't always logically articulate why something makes sense to me. And this became a problem with my editors and my agent because they they rightfully were saying, I don't understand the rules of this world. Like, you're breaking your own rules all over the place. Like what is going on? And so some of those changes were necessary to not lose readers, to not make it such a mess that people would just disengage. Some of it was me going back in and saying, no, this works on a, maybe not on a logical level. Uh, I understand that this doesn't always hold together <laughs> um, if you're really thinking about it, but it works for me emotionally. And so I think that's the structure of it. And even with the history lesson, and I think that's an okay word to use. I think there is an element of it being yeah. didactic, educational, I don't know. I just think of it as like putting some veggies in the book because <laughs> a lot of the book, you know, is. You know, it's, it's I, I I think it's fun and it's it's candy and so I, I wanted some veggies, uh, but but it also <laughs> felt right emotionally. Right. Yeah, I love that. And no, I love the comparison to Walter Murch's uh, hierarchy of editing needs, his rule six, and and that I, ideally you can find the choice that that satisfies all of them. But yeah, I, I, it's it's true. I mean, there is it's I, I think that it's not um, you know. Screenplays perhaps have to be governed by somewhat rigid rules, but your, yours does not have to be. And there's a there's a playfulness as well as a rigor to the way you you explore those rules. And um, yeah, it's just there. And I, it's 
we're getting, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. You know, we've already talked about kind of the end of the book and and the, the structure and the, st the form, but you know, the story here, and I, it's, that's partly because of the way it's written, but yeah, I'll just go into, um, there's this early passage of the novel where you lay out the uh, Chinatown SRO apartment complex where Willis and his family live. And you, you take us through that floor by floor and you tell us who lives in these rooms and, and you sketch these very moving and sometimes heartbreaking vignettes of, of life here, um, including the one in which, um, you know, an old man dies in a freak accident in the bathroom while waiting for a call from his son, which when I read that and then you, you know, you explore this too, I think it's like, it, it actually <laughs> struck me as the most like Asian guilt triggering thing I'd read in a while. And, you know, there, can you just talk about, because this part of it is, you know, it's, you're definitely, there's nothing about this that uh, would be out of place, I think, in, in, a, in a more conventionally uh, written or structured novel. But yeah, can you just, just that, that there's, that's one of the most moving parts of the book for me. And, and can you talk about just that and how you sort of diagrammed this, um, this part of Chinatown? Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I, 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 um, uh, I think it was, um, you know, the, to people that haven't read it, um, it's the, Willis Wu works at a, a restaurant called Golden, Golden Palace. And, you know, he's, he's a waiter. So he's generic Asian man number three, and he's standing in the background. He doesn't have any lines. You know, he's not part of the show. Um, and that is the front stage of this Chinatown. It's Chinatown as, you know, um, in, uh, what's the theater term? In front of the proscenium, right? And, and then there's a backstage and that's where the, that's where the Asians live, you know, when they're, that's where the, it's sort of like a holding pen for the extras in a way, but, or a dorm, I guess. Um, and they live in this high rise sort of, you know, it's nine stories and it, each of them kind of have their own room. And this is, this is where they are humans. You know, this is where they live their lives and have their relationships and, and eat and sleep and, um, you know, fight and all, all those things that they don't get to do on the front stage. And um, kind of Willis in the book moves back and forth between this world. Willis and the other characters, the other Asians move back and forth between these worlds. And, you know, I think one of the things that I really wanted to explore is, you know, that is the idea of like dimensionality that in the front, they become these really, really flattened stereotypes, literally just turned into yes. Asian. And in the back, you can't even categorize all of them. There's so many. I wanted it to be kind of a, like a overflowing of individuality and of quirks and, and of, like you're saying, Justin, vignettes and, and these kind of scenes of life that we don't get. And, and just all the nouns, like all the thinginess of how they live, um, you know, the, all, all of them in their range of ages, you know, from, you know, 20 on up to whatever. And so, um, and, and so, yeah, that, I think that's what I was trying to portray is, is really uh, just giving a sense of this, of this in, in interior space, really. Yeah. It comes through so vividly, Charles. And I, I wanted to ask, you know, I'm just curious, as you were, you know, I know you read and you quote from uh, Bonnie Choi's book, uh, American Chinatown, uh, from Phil Choi's book, San Francisco Chinatown, um, but this research, but also, you know, what what meaning did Chinatown have for you growing up? I mean, I could just, I might as well answer my own question, you know, as someone who grew up in, you know, heavily Asian American populated Orange County suburbia and, and now lives in Los Angeles, um, it, Chinatown was never really the hub that it, it may have been for others, um, or in, in other in other cities or in other uh, parts of the country. Um, it, you know, I very much grew up feeling steeped in a lot of local Chinese American communities, but Chinatown was always weirdly, I don't want to say foreign, but it was just not a place that I felt any kind of identification with. And I'm just curious, what was your experience of any end? And, and yeah, and how did the um, just the the research of learning more about Chinatowns in the U.S. Uh, inform inform the book? Yeah, we have a sort of weird parallel existence because uh, <laughs> uh, you were, I guess you grew up in Orange County and moved to LA, I guess, and now I've done the opposite. Right. <laughs> uh, lived in LA and, you know, Mar Vista, uh, went to Culver City schools and um, 
came down here a few years ago with my family. And another weird trivia fact, am I right? I think we have the same birthday. Are you, were you January oh, God. 3rd? This is weird. Charles, also, am I creeping you out? It is. A, a little bit, but in a, in a, in a pleasant way. Uh, you know, in a, it's, it's, that is odd and kind of cool. That is, yeah. that you're, and you're absolutely right. Yes, we do have the same birthday and uh, reverse trajectories, I guess. So, oh my God. Okay, I can't wait to see where this is going, but yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a film critic and I hope to someday write a film and then somehow we'll like, I don't know, the universe will invert. And I, I feel like this is a Christopher <laughs> Nolan thing. Um, uh, now I forgot what you asked me about. Oh, Chinatown. Yeah. It's all right. Um, <laughs> this is way more uh, interesting. Uh, but no, yeah, Chinatown. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, when I told my, um, after I finished the book, when I told my mom what the book was about, she's like, her first, her first comment was, what do you know about Chinatown? I'm like, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, it, I think my experience is similar to yours. You know, there isn't yeah. in the way that like San Francisco or Oakland or, you know, Flushing or New York Chinatown, um, there isn't, I mean, there is, there is, but that wasn't the sure. hub. And, and, and even, and when we were, when I was growing up, I think I'm a little older than you, but it, it certainly wasn't the, even kind of what it was today. I feel like it, it, it was like a couple, I remember a couple of dim some places, Empress Pavilion, right. where you go to, um, Empress but Pavilion, more, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more, it would be like Monterey Park, San Gabriel, yep. you know, uh, Alhambra, like, and so, um, so it, 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 honestly, not a lot of direct experience. I mean, that, that's, um, it, it's more a place in my mind, you know, and it's a place yep. on TV and in movies for me. And so I had to yep. do that research and also, um, I wasn't trying to necessarily create a physical, well, I, I wasn't trying to recreate an actual Chinatown, you know, based on any one, but to take bits and pieces of a bunch of them. Got it. You know, I, I, Willis's character is, is often referred to uh, as, you know, generic Asian man. Uh, it's just kind of the, the base role that he has come to play. Um, one of the really fun, sometimes painfully fun parts of the book is uh, you have this whole litany of marginalized identities that he and other Asian people in the book wear. Like for him, it's, you know, disgraced son, delivery guy, guy who runs in and gets kicked in the face. And uh, these are the background roles that he plays, uh, you know, and his mother, you know, has roles like pretty oriental flower, Asiatic seductress. I mean, I was just again, laughing quite painfully at a lot of this. Um, and, and just what was it like to unpack and to sort of itemize all these different stereotypes? Because in a weird way, it made me think, well, we may suffer from a lack of diverse representation, but there's actually quite a bit of variety in these stereotypes. So I guess that's something. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, just it's tell, tell, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was... Uh, a weirdly cathartic, almost yeah. almost exciting thing to start to list them out. I remember that feeling like one of those moments where I had tapped into something that was a little uncomfortable, you know, uh, writing down these stereotypes. And I, I also realized like they came pretty quickly and easily and I didn't know what exactly they were based on. You know, I had taken, I think I took one film class at Berkeley and, um, I have watched things, you know, read a few things, read your book, read Walter Murch's book. You know, I, it's not like I am steeped in like cinema or the history of movies or anything. Um, and, and yet they were all there. And I recently had a conversation uh, on Zoom with uh, Arthur Dong, the author of a book called Hollywood Chinese, and he made a documentary. I'm guessing you're <laughs> familiar with him. Um, and in reading Arthur's book and watching his movie, I realized how many of the things that I had listed before I had ever read Arthur's book were actually based on real things. I realized there must be some kind of collective unconscious where these stereotypes live. Maybe, maybe for Asian Americans specifically, but maybe also that's what, it, that's what this book is kind of tapping into um, that decades and decades of movies and shows that have portrayed Asians in this way 
have had an aggregate cumulative effect to create this repository of ideas that just live in there without even being conscious of it, you know? And that's where this comes from, I guess. Um, I'm not sure I answered the question. But no, you did. And it's it's actually, I mean, it's, it, I feel like it's one of the incidental things maybe to emerge, but it's it's as if we do have this sort of this, this <laughs> taxonomy of stereotypes that, it, it, that this book kind of, uh, contributes to it, and it's helpful to know them. Um, and, 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 you know, I mentioned Willis's mom and, and his dad, you, you do focus at some length on his parents, their struggles and their histories, uh, the roles that they too have been forced into and ways in which they have been taken advantage of. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's notable too, I think that it's when Willis notices his own father being slighted, mistreated, that he musters the courage to do something about it. And for the moment, at least sees control of the narrative. And you can just talk about shaping the parents as characters. And I, I think this is very important because I, I guess we can say this as Asian Americans, the role that our parents play in our lives is something that is whether it's good, whether it's bad, and it's always both, I think, um, is something that is so hard to shake um, and, and goes with us whether we like it or not. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, shaping the parents was both the, so some of the first stuff that got written, you know, the, the chunk that I carried from, you know, before pre, pre-epiphany to post-epiphany, that was all parent stuff. Uh, it makes it sound so grand, but it was just the moment when I uh, got freaked out and realized I had to finish this book or my publisher would <laughs> drop me. Um, uh, no, they were very patient. I should, I should say that they're incredibly patient and supportive. Um, yeah. The, so the, some of the backstory stuff of the parents um, was based, you know, loosely on um biographical details from my own parents, you know, um, mm -hmm. and even bits and bobs, things that like from my wife's family, like she's told me over the years or I've heard, and I didn't have a place. I, I, I just collect these things. Uh, another reminder, anyone who has novelists in your life, be careful. You're, they're always mining you for material. Um, no, I, I just didn't know what to do with this, you know, and, but I knew I wanted to go somewhere. And so after this framework, the script framework started to take shape, I wondered, where does this fit, you know? And so I, I thought, well, it's kind of a backstory. You know, how do I get Willis to travel through this backstory and experience these things emotionally? You know, that, that was really it. So, um, and as characters, it was really um, wanting to give life and subjectivity and um, dimensionality yeah. to, to, you know, I think at least in the American sort of film TV landscape, characters that at least I never saw growing up, you didn't see these right. characters on screen. If you did, they were either types or they were silent or maybe played for a joke or, you know, they, they certainly didn't, you know, have speaking roles and and they didn't speak English usually. And if they did, it, it would be broken or something, you know? So right. to just really make these three-dimensional human beings and tell their stories was um, was really an essential part of it for me. Yeah, yeah. I love when they, the book shifts perspectives and, and goes with them for a while, especially with, um, with his mother, uh, Willis's mother. I, I, just switching gears a little bit, you know, another dimension of the book and and one that I think feels particularly prescient right now is that you you spend quite a time developing the dynamic, the very fraught dynamic sometimes between Willis and between uh, the lead actors of this series, this Law and Order style series, Black and White, Miles Turner, um, the Black lead, and Sarah Green, the White lead. And we see this in the tension between Turner and, and Willis, which Green often has to step in and mediate. Um, and there's this, uh, I, I know most most of our guests have have, re have read the book, but it, I, not to spoil too much, but I will just say there is this extraordinary exchange late in the book um, where Willis 
his thoughts are being articulated. And it's, I, I, I apologize if you, if you are not crazy about having me quote your words at you, but it's, I, th I think it's so good. I want to, I want to read it anyways. Um, you, you somehow feel that your oppression, because it does not include the original American sin of slavery, that it will never add up to something equivalent, that the wrongs committed against your ancestors are incommensurate in magnitude with those committed against black people in America. And I, I think that this is something so important to talk about right now. Um, it, it does touch on something that is very relevant to this moment. Uh, I, I think it speaks to um, tensions of every kind, to uh, you know, anti-black racism among Asian people, uh, anti-Asian racism among black people. Um, Elsewhere in the book, you talk about um, Asians as a model minority, um, and, and the, which we know, of course, has been used to basically weaponize Asian people against Black people and other people of color. <laughs> it's a lot, I know, but you know, it, 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 again, it, it feels very prescient. And at what point? Maybe not even prescient. I mean, these things are have always they've never not been relevant. It's just that they've only now been brought to the surface in a bigger, louder way. But at what point did you know that? Okay, given that this is the story I'm telling, I'm just telling a story about the complexities of Asian American identity, but I'm also gonna go into these nuances in how we relate to others and that decide that you were gonna confront those really head on. Yeah, um, what point? You know, at, at early points, and then I tried to dodge them, <laughs> and run away from them. <laughs> now, yeah. keep it light, keep it light. Uh, right. Don't get right. in over your head. And that was a constant reminder. I mean, going back to how we started about humility, it was, you know, stay in your side of the pool, you know, like, I, I don't, you know, like, be careful, because I, I didn't know. I, I just felt like if I got too far away from the story I was trying to tell about Willis and his family specifically, it would have such a gravity and pull the story toward it could pull the story towards all kinds of other things that would be worth writing a book about. But one, I'm not sure that I am the best person to write that book. And two, that wasn't this book. So, um, but I felt like the other, you know, voice on my shoulder was saying, wait, you can't ignore it, you know, like, that's crazy. So um, it was sort of like, find a way to brush up against these things in a way that didn't feel totally cursory, that would at least acknowledge it. I guess I wanted to sort of pass a kind of, not, not the Bechdel test, but like a, a variation on it where, like, I want to have a book where two people of color have a conversation that's not at all about race. I'm not sure I actually right. passed that test in this book, <laughs> but yeah. um, it's like so, so much of, you know, the, you, I, I, how do I put this without just sounding incredibly reductive, but so much of the polarity or what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, you think, oh, look, uh, a movie with an Asian person, or look, a movie with a black person, and then they're they're going to be paired with the the white lead, or somehow the story still revolves around that. And and to actually see, like this this happens more now, but when I grew up in the eighties and nineties, you didn't see like two people of color on screen talking to each other without any any white person in the frame. That that would have been really exciting. I mean, it, it happened. I, I remember a few times, sure. but. It um, so f just in other words to decenter the perspective so that any two people in this universe should be able to have a conversation with each other. That's that's how I wanted to approach it, you know. And and yeah, I did want to at least touch on, you know, like Miles Turner and Willis Wu's relationship. And yeah. Willis has grown up seeing Miles Turner some and and other people like him as the epitome of cool you know, the epitome of masculine mm -hmm. and tough. And what does that do to his psyche? I think that that's the, that's a place that I felt comfortable writing about because I can certainly empathize with that is, you know, seeing this. And, and then the place I felt comfortable sort of dipping into Miles's head, I guess, would, would be, what does it do if you're always seen that way? Or if that's an expectation and how limiting and rigid can that be just to be seen as hyper-masculine or you have to be, you know, tough or cool. So. Absolutely. That it's no, it, 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 <clears throat> it says a lot of things that I, I don't think I've made not in the context of, of a novel necessarily, or, or even in, in art, I've of course thought of these ideas a lot, but it, it was so, 
there was something very audacious, I think, about seeing it um, laid out that way um, in, in, in the, what, it, what the book builds to. Um, I, I want to, I'll step back a little bit, you know, just talking about you, you know, you've, you found your way um, to writing over a period of time. You know, you've, you've worn many different hats before. Uh, you know, you went to law school. You studied biology. You were, you know, you practiced law for many years. Um, it's funny because I find writing to be so difficult sometimes that I don't think I could have done it without um, devoting myself to it just full time. And so, I to, to hear that people like yourself who have um, written on the side while holding down uh, full time careers. I mean, it's. I, it seems so daunting to me. Uh, what, when can you just talk about that? When that crossover into writing began, and um, when it began to take hold, and, and I know it must have taken discipline to uh, to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah discipline. <clears throat> and I don't think of myself as a especially disciplined person. <laughs> you can ask my parents. I certainly wasn't <laughs> growing up, um, but I think law school and being a lawyer helped with that. I, um, I, you know, and I, and the main thing is I love doing it. You know, I love is a strong word. I, I can't not do it. You know, I, my wife unfortunately has suffered through times where either I'm blocked or I'm just not getting a lot of time to write or it's not working out. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so quick on the trigger. Um, uh, there, there we are. Yes. Um, uh, and our dog Maisie, um, Thank you for that. Uh, and and uh, and you know, it sacrificed time away from my kids. You know, like they're getting older now. There were a lot of years spent, you know, growing up with like they had never seen me publish a book. You know, and they're too young to know the last time I did it. So it was just kind of this mythical thing, like oh, dad goes in that room and gets really mad and then comes out um, <laughs> in a bad mood. So there was that. I mean, I mean, what happened was it happened very gradually and all at once. You know, like I, I got, yeah. I, I was publishing stories, publishing books, started to go, you know, on meetings. I had some, you know, wonderful people who encouraged me along the way. Um, and um, they would um, really sort of try to get me to, think about this as a career, I guess, it is both in books and maybe in TV and film. And so editors, agents, just the, for a lot of years, like the only people reading my stuff, really. And I, I never really had the guts or honestly, the book sales to even think about it. There, there was no viable path to like independence. Mm -hmm. And I was going to go right. and write in the cabin. It was only when TV, you know, and, and, um, the showrunners of Westworld, you know, called and said, do you want to come interview for a job? That That's how I made the leap, really. And so one day job replaced the other day job, basically. Got it, yeah. I wanted to ask, too, and especially since we've established our weird uh, twinship in odd ways, um, I'm wondering if you've had this experience as a writer, because, you know, for me as a critic, you know, I, you know, I try to write about all kinds of things. And I, I was initially, I think, always reluctant to write about uh, my race, my experience. Uh, I, I never wanted to necessarily foreground that or be seen as exploiting it in any way. And that I had very mixed feelings about that because to not write about it is, of course, on some level to perpetuate the invisibility, perhaps. And it, it took me a while to get comfortable with that idea of, of, of not broaching it and not being afraid to because, of course, it's, it's hugely important in terms of... Uh, um, critical writing about entertainment and about what stories get told and all and, and such. And I'm just wondering if you if you had any similar experience at all. I mean, you know, you establish yourself as a writer on on a, a diverse array of subjects and, and genres, and um, writing a lot of uh, you know science fiction among other things. But you know, stealing yourself to say, okay, I am going to write this novel that does confront the complexities of Asian American identity head on. I mean, was that a a, diff a leap that you had to make, uh, a difficult leap, or was it just kind of not a leap? Uh... Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it was a leap. It was a leap for sure. Uh, it, it was a leap uh, psychologically to say, can I do this? Do I want to try? Uh, it's a risk, right? It's like I could really just stay in this lane and write things that I sort of 
feel like I have some grasp on and also remain, you know, just fairly comfortable in no one's going to pay attention anyway. So, you know, uh, and, and just publish books. I mean, that's already incredible privilege. And it would have absolutely asked me, you know, when I started writing, if you could just publish books, would you not be thrilled? I would be thrilled. And so, so why would I, why take a risk with something that could really just be a train wreck, you know, um, with all these crazy elements. And, and as you're saying, the most crucial part, Justin, that, as you pointed out is, uh, was there was an anxiety about writing about Asian American identity, you know, and about writing on these topics that felt, I don't know, sensitive and more complex than I knew what to do with. You know, I, I think of, and I, you know, I don't know that I'm unique at all in this, but I think of my tool set as very homemade, you know, like I made it in my garage. I don't, yeah. um, I don't, I, I don't have like, I don't know. I I feel like both in reading and in craft, it, it was like, oh, I I have all these weird things that I've learned how to do over 15 years of writing fiction or whatever it was. That when I started writing this book, I'd only been writing fiction in like 12 years. So I just felt like, yeah. do I know how to do this? You know? And so <laughs> the leap was really like, I don't know that I do, but I'm gonna fashion my own tools and just figure it out and my own materials and Whatever comes of it, you know, comes of it, I guess. Yeah. I, I think you made something brilliant out of it. And, you know, I, I and I'm glad to, too that, you know, in terms of our sort of, yeah, getting over this anxiety that sometimes arises, you know, you, I'm also glad you wrote, you wrote a piece recently, um, or maybe it was last year, I can't remember. Um, it was last year, sorry. Um, it was a piece for Time Magazine. Uh, it came out around the time that the book was published. Um, where you talked about this, you know, what it's like to never see yourself on TV and that particular, you know, and, and you wrote this from the standpoint, of course, of having been a, a TV writer and producer for some time and commented on the weird position that you're now in, because of course uh, you have the, the ability to do something about um, the lack of diversity. And of course um, we've seen progress and you write about the progress that the industry has made in, in film and television and, and yet also the limitations of that progress. and. The, the sort of two steps back that, um, um, or the sort of Sisyphean kind of cycle that it may, that may may kind of lead us to. But yeah, I, I don't know, this is a very broad, big question. You know, I, I, I get asked this question, I don't know how to answer it, but do you feel, you know, do you, feel, do you feel optimistic about the future and about because of where we are in this current cycle where obviously our visibility is, uh, you know, it, it, it is on the industry's mind at the very least, which we couldn't, as you said, we couldn't necessarily say that. 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, and I really want to hear your answer too, because I think you have a <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but I, I just wanted to lead with that so that you have time to think of it. If you, you probably have a super practice, awesome answer. So I don't want to. Oh. <laughs> I um, wish I did. I'll think about it though. But go on, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I, honestly, I don't. I don't have a lot of perspective on it other than as a viewer, you know, I mean, of course, yeah, I'm trying, I'm in the process of developing things. And I'm lucky enough to have that chance, as, as you said, to possibly do something about it. Um, I, I think if you, if, if you showed 2000, 2005 me, what was, you know, on TV now, it would have blown my mind in some ways, you know, or, mm -hmm. 2010 even, you know, I, I don't know that I would have been able to imagine that we could be, I mean, you would hope for it, but I think Sisyphean, as you said, is really a great term. I think that's part of why in the book, Willis's life is so cyclical for a while. It just felt like on many levels, you could have the conversation and then a generation later, you could be having it again and wondering why nothing moved forward. And what what is it about, you know, Asians on screen that just seems to get stuck? You know, again to go back to this conversation about you know, with Arthur Dong and then jumping into like the kind of history, it it really struck me to realize how early Asians were in film, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Sachu Hayakawa and Anna Mae Wong. It was decades ago, a century ago in some case, oh, maybe not quite, mm -hmm. but. A long time ago. And so then in the 80s and 90s, 
to be still having a, a case where it's an incredible special event for, for Asians to be in anything. And, you know, and then fast forward, of course, to, to just a few years ago when it started to, I feel like, really change. So yeah. that's all a very long-winded way of saying, I feel like this is an actual, tra tra it's actual traction in a way that I haven't seen in my four decades plus. But I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know that I can improve on your answer, honestly. And I, uh, for all the time I'm supposed to spend thinking about an answer, <laughs> but um, and be beyond just this conversation, but just in general in, in my work, um, I, I would say though that yeah, I, I'm tentatively optimistic too. Um, you know, uh, I but it is you know, and the the comparison to Sisyphus, I think I took it from partly from your piece where you you invoked Groundhog Day and this kind of okay, this kind of collective relentless cycle of amnesia where you know it's like. It's not even two steps forward, one step. I don't know. It's like one step forward, one step back. It's almost like one to one. I mean, I think about the gaps between milestones. It's like, you know, in, in TV and in film, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I remember when, you know, All American Girl was on the air and then all the, the gap of time between that and Fresh Off the Boat. I remember, you know, it's like 93 when Joy Luck Club came out and then, you know, Crazy Rich Asians, however many years, decades later. And there's something that is really... <clears throat> more dispiriting than heartening, I think, about the gaps in between those milestones. And of course, um, whether they're milestones or, or just blips, you know, can be, you know, can be debated to death and has been. But um, that said, clearly something's changing. And, and it's you, you, what you said too about how the, the, the fact that Asians were there surprisingly early. I, I think it's just a, a humbling reminder that we we sometimes kid ourselves when we think that we are necessarily living in a automatically more progressive generation or a more enlightened era, you know, I mean, they're, I mean, certainly we are in some ways, but, but not in all respects necessarily. So that's, that's kind of my addendum to your, your answer, which I, I very much agree with. Um, I, um, I'm having so much fun talking to you, but I, I know we have a lot of reader questions. I, I am going to, um, and I don't, I don't want to shortchange them, but I want to, Ask, this will be my last question for you, Charles. Um, you know, I, I know that you know Interior Chinatown is going to become a TV series, um, and so it kind of comes full circle in a way. You know, it's uh, you know I know you probably can't go into it too much at this point, but uh, can you give us some sense of what, not even what it's going to be, but what the process has been? I mean, of taking a novel that was written like a teleplay and then turning it into an actual teleplay. <laughs> Um, I, I just the, the kind of meta knots that that ties us up in. I don't even know where we where you must where your head must be at with that. But tell us about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, meta knots is good. I like that. I might just start <laughs> writing that. I like <laughs> I like a, I don't know an opera cycle about an opera. I don't know. Um, it it uh, yeah. I feel like I tied myself up in the basement somehow, and now I. Uh, you know, be careful what you wish for because it, it's a dream and it's an incredible opportunity. The process has been really, really great. I mean, I, you know, um, Hulu was an early and super uh, supportive advocate for the book and for it as a show. And I'm lucky enough to work with um, uh, Rideback and Participant. They're both producers on the project and they have been, you know, um, really valuable voices and trying to help me. But ultimately, I, you know, feel like at this point, I have to sort of figure out what it's going to be because a lot of the stuff that works on the page, you know, um, doesn't necessarily translate to the screen one for one. In fact, some of it really kind of has to be reinvented. You know, a, a novel is a, a good vehicle for navigating interior spaces, uh, mm -hmm. but so, so you can't really film the inside of Willis's head. So, or you can probably, but I, I'm not Charlie Kaufman, you know, I'm not the person who's necessarily going to be able to try to translate that. So I have to do some inventing and hopefully, you know, do a good enough job that they'll actually <laughs> film it. Well, Best wishes with that, and I we can't wait to see uh, what what that is going to look like. And um, thank you, Charles. It's been a pleasure 
talking to you, um, and I'm going to stick around, and I'm going to bring back Donna now, who will uh, lead us in questions from our many readers um, about you and about Interior Chinatown. Uh, great. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Thank you both. Wow, that was so fascinating. Um, and we have to have you back to interview Justin uh, and ask yes. him more questions, because that was <laughs> that was some of the best parts. Deal. That was terrific. <laughs> Well, um, I'm glad you guys talked about the Hulu series because we've had readers wanting to know um, what's next. Um, when do we get to see that? Do you have is there a time frame or? <laughs> um, there's a schedule, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be on. You know that they'll air it. You know, I, I think they've uh, they're uh, passionate and committed, and I still have to figure it out. So I, I don't know that. I can guarantee anything at this point other than I'm going to try my hardest. Right after I get off the Zoom, in fact, I'm going to keep going. So, <laughs> so if any Hulu executives are watching right now, I am working, I promise. Uh, this is part of work. Talking to Justin and Donna is helping me, you know. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll shift the subject. We have other questions coming in uh, from a reader named Wandra. Um, it turns out her book club is uh, reading Interior Chinatown as well. She says they've been having their own great discussion. And she says, we are all wondering if the 45 day rule was true for any Asian actor after a death scene. Uh, so can you uh, comment on that? <laughs> Not that I know of. I, as far as I know, I'm. I, I made that up. I think it's fictional. It, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody had a role like that. I think it'd be a good idea. <laughs> um, I did see that happen on a show recently where somebody, a background Asian, was in one scene, and I'm pretty sure it was used in a different setting where it didn't make any sense that that was the same person, unless it was some kind of crazy meta joke. Uh, so maybe they could have used the 45 day rule, but it was more me wanting to. Yeah, both kind of impose a kind of logic on the on the this world, and it was sort of using my lawyer skills because I was like drafting a little bit of a regulation. So it's like two for one. Well, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from Shelley, and um, she notes that in both Westworld and Interior Chinatown, you take the concept of living in two worlds to an extreme of there actual being two worlds. Can you talk about how you came to have this construct for your novel and how it allows you to get certain themes across in a unique way? Yeah, thank you, Shelley. Um, and and thanks to Wandra for reading the book with your club too. I appreciate that. Um, I yeah, I think I think being in the room, the writers room for Westfield, had, must have had a pretty big effect. You know, I was um, it's my first job in TV, and I spent a lot of hours, you know, learning from and talking to all these other writers, and just living in that world for season one. There's this kind of you know upstairs downstairs thing going on. Um, I didn't think about it explicitly as I wrote. It wasn't until later on with some of the themes and or devices that sort of I, I was using, I realized, oh, this is this does have some overlap. And um in in the interior of Chinatown, it was this this feeling of um, you know, identity as a kind of performance. So racial identity is one thing, or gender identity or but also identity in your role as a son, as a daughter, as a spouse, as a parent. And all of these roles, you know, how we play them both in our private, uh, sorry, in our public lives, but also even in our private lives. I, I was really looking for a way to, um, like a framework to kind of, uh, ele not, I'm not, I'm not gonna call my own thing elegant, but like, to efficiently allow the reader to understand where they were. And so that really was the screenplay format. And, you know, using this idea that I borrowed from, you know, the sociologist Irving Goffman of, of the, the self as a performance. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from a reader named Sandra who identifies herself as an older Asian woman. And she says, because Hollywood and American history have reduced us to inconsequential tropes, we have been made invisible, non-existent in discussions of race in America, 
and easy targets for racial hate. So she wants to know, how can we make ourselves seen for who we are? Thanks, Sandra. Um, yeah, that's a really hard and important question that has become, I mean, I don't know, if to the forefront, but more so than any time that I remember, you know, um, that people, like we're having this conversation now on the LA Times book club. And so, and and I think to some extent, even, you know, the, the news and, and other places are, are having this, this conversation. So how do you keep it going? Is, you know, I mean, why does it have to take um, thousands of acts of harassment and violence? Why does it have to, why is that the only kind of, um, thing that can provide enough momentum for this conversation to become, you know, public enough and widespread enough that people even know what you're talking about. Because not too, you know, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, if you sort of brought some of these things up, you might be met with either indifference or kind of like quizzical looks like, is it really that bad? You know, like I, I never got the sense that Asians had it so bad in America. So I, I you know, I, I don't know that I have good answers. I don't know that I have, you know, concrete steps for how do you um, keep the momentum going other than to um, have these conversations. You know, I take, I, I take inspiration and motivation from you know, talking to readers and writers and critics and editors, and I bring that to the next conversation, you know, and I, I, I'm hoping of all the people watching, you know, some fraction of them will also, in, in whenever it is, they're talking to their aunt, their cousin, their boss, whatever, the next conversation they have, they're 5% more aware of this, they're 5% more empathetic. Does that have its own kind of you know, growth curve to it. I, I hope so. You know, it's all very nebulous. I, I, I wish I, I had a, you know, and I think the other way is to tell specific authentic stories, undiluted, you know, tell your experience, whatever that means, you know, bring, as Justin and I were talking about for a lot of time, for a long time, I felt like I had to hide certain aspects of my identity, you know, whether that was in the workplace or through my writing. I was afraid that if I sort of showed my whole self, people wouldn't accept it. It was too weird or they just wouldn't know where I was coming from or it would just be too much to deal with. So I, I really wanted to sort of scrub off the markers that made me different and, and really conform. And I think for a long time that sort of stifled me. It stifled me creatively. It stifled me personally. And, you know, I, I do think we're in an atmosphere now where, Sandra, people will want to hear your story. I hope they will. I hope they'll want to know, oh, what makes you more than the stereotype? What, tell me about all of, you know, the things that you want to tell me about. So whether you're a writer or not, I feel like there's a a good opportunity to start sharing that, you know, with other people. Uh, we also heard from someone who went to high school with you, um, oh. Eric, Ch Eric Chen, and uh, he um, he builds on some of the um, similar topics and and what you and um, uh, Justin have been discussing and and we just had a, a, had quite a few questions around um, representation of Asian Americans in um, film and television. But this specific question, um, he says, uh, while progress has been made in media with stand-ups, uh, sitcoms, and movies with Asian leads, when do you think Asians will have a fair share of equity? Any any thoughts on that? Hmm. Thanks, Eric. Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't want to put Justin on the spot, but I'm also curious to hear what he thinks. But he, I've already maybe used up my quota for Justin on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I here's a, as as Justin was naming the milestones or blips, depending on how you look at it. I one thought that struck me was that he can still name them, you know, that, that they're small enough in number that all of us remember <laughs> exactly how, how big a deal it was, you know, uh, and, you know, another one was better luck tomorrow. I remember when I actually went to the century city mall and, and watched that. And 
uh, I was just thinking, what am I watching? I'm watching this, you know, like it wasn't, uh, it was just such a strange experience and, um, and exciting. And, um, so I don't know if this is fair share of equity, but when there's too many to name and you're like, why would I try to name all the Asian things? <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> like I wouldn't name all the things by other group X group. So maybe that's a goal. Well, thank you. Um, and now this question, we will put Justin on the spot because a reader named Olivia, uh, she says she has a question for both of you. Uh, and so let's let's start off uh, putting Justin on this one. Um, and she says, as scripted TV covers more social issues, as they should, uh, there could be criticism for coming off as too didactic. How can TV creators best tell stories uh, without only teaching lessons? Justin, why don't you start us off, and then we'll uh, then we'll throw it over to Charles too. Sure, and I'll expand uh, the parameters of the question to include uh, film creators, filmmakers as well, because that's the medium I'm more much more uh, versed in. Uh, you know, I think we sort of hit on this uh, where you know Charles and I kind of generally sort of this this I this this when I meant said described the book as becoming a lesson at, at a certain point and you know I, I quickly kind of apologized and said like oh I didn't mean to imply that it was didactic and Charles was like no no it's okay um you know that's that's fine and and I I actually think we understand each other perfectly on that because there is this sort of cloud or stigma stigma whatever or just this this dislike of the idea that art can never be or should ever be didactic it's something that I think as a critic one of the first things you learn to call out of uh, it's like I don't know when you're growing, you know the after school special type of type of entertainment you're watching you know you don't call out didacticism and that's you know there's a reason for that of course but I you know didacticism has its place you know when in interior Chinatown when you know we are learning about this history of an, an anti-Asian discrimination in the United States of course there is a didactic element of that and rightly so um, but it is smartly, I think, uh, <clears throat> contrasted and, and, and uh, you know, juxtaposed with the rest of the book, which is um, it written in a very different register. And so I think that, uh, not to get too abstract about this, but I, I think teaching, um, I think a, a didactic approach absolutely can have its place. Um, and, you know, I think that as there are, there are lessons to learn from from Asian American experience, and there are lessons to learn from Latino experience and Black experience, and every other you know culture that it, that we're hopefully seeing more and more stories about and by. And so, if some of those are imparted in a way that maybe feels a little sledgehammery, well, that's that's fine as long, but as long as they are imparted artfully by others, um, I don't know exactly, but I've always found it to be a good rule of thumb to make sure that as a if you're a filmmaker or a TV creator, to have it was this lesson speak speak through your characters, not for them. And I don't know. That's maybe what I'll leave it with. It's like I think there's a very fine difference between treating your characters as just mouthpieces versus actually, you know, having their experience express something that um, without necessarily, you know, pointing the finger. Um, Charles is the one who has actually written TV characters, and so I will let him, you know, judge whether that is good advice or or not. But that's that's the thing that comes to mind for me. Yeah, no, I I love that. I I'm going to remember that. I mean, I think it's such a useful formulation um, and sh and succinct, you know. So, um, I I don't know that I can improve on what Justin said. So I, I think I'll just add my gloss in terms of both a book and, and a potential show. Um, I, I did, I'll confess, you know, part of me when I was, I was sort of joking about sneaking in some veggies with it, but I thought in some kind of novelistic equivalent of service journalism, I thought, look, I don't know how this book is gonna be received. I don't know if people are gonna like it, if the story will resonate with people, but at the very least, some number of people will buy this and may learn something that they didn't know because honestly, I didn't know a lot of it. I, I knew parts of it, but I, I didn't always, um, you know, I didn't always think of it as, as sort of a cohesive whole. And so um, 
I, I wanted to put it in there because it was important, you know, and, and I, I do think there are times where it slips into mouthpiece, maybe not here always, but what Justin said about writing in different registers, so, so great. I think it's so true. It's like, if it can be entertaining enough, then people won't notice the didacticism. <laughs> you know, if you can blend it up, uh, it's, it's possibly, uh, you can just sneak it in there. So um, you may have just seen anxiety flash across my face. It's because my computer just told me that it's about to die. <laughs> so, uh, but I think we're okay. But if you see me reaching around, I'm just trying to charge my computer. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, Sorry well, I, I'll actually um, just, this will be our last question from readers. Um, and one of the things people who come to our book club, they love to talk about writing and process. That's always um, one of our most popular questions. So um, this question comes from a reader named Sky, who um, was a longtime successful journalist at um, CBS News, the Boston Globe, made the transition to writing for t film and television. But now she would like your advice. Um, what steps do you recommend to become a novelist, and what are the books? Uh, there are books that work for you, or particular classes. Um, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to take my path, it's, it's probably the easiest path. Try to go to med school. Don't get in. Go to law school. Practice law for thirteen years. <laughs> write three books of experimental fiction. Uh, randomly get a job on an incredible, huge HBO show. I don't know. I mean, I'm not the person to come to for advice. I think this is honestly it's just going to sound like, I don't know, bumper sticker or inspirational advice. Oh, thanks. My lovely and incredibly smart wife is plugging in my computer, which I should have done before. Um, uh, okay, we're safe now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sure. Um, I... I think it's, I had a, 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 I have a lot of luxuries and privileges. One was that because my books didn't really reach a wider audience till later, I didn't ever have the illusion that I was going to be writing for money. <laughs> I just, uh, I just developed my voice kind of, you know, I was lucky to have readers that were seeking out my work, but I didn't, um, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't reduce my weirdness level ever. I just went for it. You know, this book is really weird. You know, I, I don't want to scare you off. If you haven't read it yet, but it's not, it's not a normal book. I don't know what a normal book is. I can't write a normal book. I, I'm incapable of it. And I don't know if that's a path to TV and film, honestly, but I feel like when I have conversations with people, one thing that sets me apart is like, and I, I believe them when they say like, I don't know a lot of people doing <laughs> what you do. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Like it, it's, it's weird. So I don't know, I guess that's my advice is write in your own undiluted voice and see if, you, if that takes you anywhere. Uh, well, I wanted to just uh, jump to uh, a practical matter, a little bit of housekeeping. For every book club event, um, we always partner with a different independent bookstores. We we try to, even though we're not doing um, in real life events, we make sure that we always have an independent bookseller. And for the, our event tonight, well, we partnered with Diesel. And of course, uh, Diesel has copies of your books that Charles was nice enough to sign. Uh, so I wanted to mention that if people want to get your weird book, uh, that's the place. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that they can find uh, personalized <laughs> copies. And um, I wouldn't call it a weird book. I would call it a very uh, just, um, you know, just engaging, just fascinating uh, story. So uh, I think you're a little harsh on your, uh, on your work. Um, but I, I, I think um, you didn't have any, any books you recommended or anything for Sky. Just you just, your approach was to just jump oh, right I'm off sorry. the building and do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I forgot that part. Okay. Um, well, I will say, and this is this is not just because we were talking about it. I I read um, I read Walter Murch's book um, after I started working in TV because I think I didn't realize until I got a little bit behind you know the scenes how much an editor does and how crucial an editor is to making the thing and. Um, so that was a fascinating thing, just as a creative person. Um, 
the, the, this idea of editing as the shaping of it. And I, I found that I actually, like I, I did a sort of one day workshop for a few years uh, through Penn in Los Angeles. And I used that rule of six that, that Walter Merch talked about, that you know emotion and rhythm and story were sort of the top three things that he thinks about in terms of structure and in terms of cutting something together. So, um, so that's one, actually, a book on editing. I, I read early on, I read Save the Cat, in which I think probably anyone who lives in LA who's tried to write a screenplay is aware of. I, 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 this is probably a very uncool thing to say. I think it's great. I, lo I love it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is a cool thing to say uh, because I didn't have any framework before that. I just thought, oh, do I just start typing? Like, what do I do? And, and I know that, you know, I, I, then I went back and read Sid Field. And, you know, uh, and so I, I also love that book. I, 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 I guess I'm just probably going to recommend a lot of books that you would easily find on any syllabus. So maybe not so useful. So that's why I'm trying to figure out like, what, what would be a thing that you wouldn't necessarily um, think of as like sort of that creative inspiration? If I think of something else, maybe I'll blurt it out <laughs> in, the, in the last seconds of this. Well, that was uh, really wonderful. Thank you for uh, the great conversation and for answering um, all the questions. And I love that you put Justin on the on the spot. I think we'll have you both back in January for a, for a toast, a little birthday celebration, and uh, we'll have to do it again. Birthday party. Oh, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to mention is um, if you want to keep up with our book club, um, I want to invite you uh, readers to sign up for the LA Times Book Club newsletter. It'll have the latest events, news. Uh, we'll share a link. And uh, if you want to watch this again or share it with a friend, you'll find this in our newsletter as well. Uh, and I also wanted to give um, everyone a heads up um, that in June, we'll be reading uh, The Beauty in the Breaking. It's a, a, it's a memoir by ER doctor Michelle Harper. And I hope um, that everyone will join us again this month. And uh, mostly, I just wanted to um, just say thank you so much. I, I could listen to you guys all night. This was so much fun. And I uh, look forward to doing it again in the future. Uh, and thank you to our readers, everyone. Um, good night. Thank you.